No, I'm not, but there's some volunteers coming around with baskets now. But uh, I'll start with your question, Sophie. Uh, how do you suggest a community addresses the racially motivated zoning and planning in their past? Well, I, th I think it's critical and important to first acknowledge that um, exclusionary zoning um, has been used historically to separate communities. I think it's important to leverage research as a way to, to make that point, to move away from kind of the emotional part of that discussion. Um, but I also think it's really, really important for the communities that aren't usually uh, provided the time um, to be in conversations like this to be invited. Um, so they can begin to talk about the challenges that they're facing and hopefully create an opportunity for people to begin the process of working together where we can begin to create the communities that everybody can be proud of. Great. Uh, a lot of fantastic questions here. This one's particularly related to what you were just saying. Uh, most of the sustainable events I go to, there are a few African Americans. What should we be doing to make our events more hospitable? So I, th I think one of the key things that you have to do is go where they are. Um, I, I think that it's really critical and important um, because that, that is a part of the sustainability conversation that you may not necessarily be aware of because it's not your reality. Um, but if you can begin the process of creating opportunities, so for example, with our work around energy equity, we actually go into communities and do trainings about the energy system and opportunities for jobs um, because we know that people don't have a lot of time or convenience sometimes to come where we are. But I tell you, it would be truly beneficial if you, if you began the process of going where they are and beginning to have more events in their communities. Great, thank you. Um, next question is, how do you mitigate gentrification when even basic improvements such as infrastructure and transportation can catalyze this process? Yes, I mean, they have. I, I mean, I have uh, been pushing um, against one large development in our city called the Atlanta Beltline. Um, that I've been actively involved in for many, many years. I think, I think there are a couple of things. One, we have to acknowledge the fact that neighborhood revitalization and gentrification are not the same thing. And a lot of times people use, similar to what I said about equity and equality, they're the same. Neighborhood revitalization and gentrification are not the same. And so if we're doing, if we're developing for someone else who we're trying to attract into the community, versus the people that are already there, that's gentrification. So we have to begin to develop policies that will acquire land in a way that, you know, whether it be through community land trusts or whether it be through housing trust funds, but you've gotta, you've gotta have the land first in order to maintain and control the market pressures. And then you also have to, through public policy, initiate things like inclusionary zoning um, and other policies that will create opportunities for people to remain. So there's, there's a plethora of policies, but the key is, is that usually those policies don't work as well if you're reacting to the market. Um, you have to be proactive um, and initiate those policies before the market ends up being out of control. All right, I think we have time for one more question, and we had two cards. <laughs> Uh, both referring to issues around uh, food and mm. equity. And so I want to try to combine those two. Um, one was about in identifying vulnerable areas in Atlanta is a lack of access to fresh food, i.e. food deserts, taken into consideration. And the other card is talking about how can we use social dollars, i.e. food stamps, WIC, uh, Medicaid to revitalize underserved communities. Mm, it's interesting. So, so a couple of things. You know, when we talk about the food equity conversation, a lot of times people focus on the food deserts, but not necessarily the food swamps, right? So you have food deserts where you have communities that don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables, but then you also have communities that have a plethora of fast food restaurants, hamburgers, hot dogs. And, and, and food that is not healthy. So for the food equity conversation to truly realize itself, you have to be sensitive to the lack of food access, 
and also the abundance of bad foods in communities that create an unhealthy environment for people that live there. Um, secondly, um, you know, are local jurisdictions and, and used on the state level allowing um, communities to use leveraged food stamps as a way to go to farmers markets and other places to buy fresh fruits and vegetables is one easy policy solution. But also to community ownership, right? So moving beyond, again, looking at communities that have been left, left behind as consumers, but actually makers, also provides a great opportunity for food equity. So is there an opportunity for you to support a food co-op where people can actually grow food in their communities and actually have shares of that business that they can own, where they can own and sell um, the, the food that they're actually growing? Um, that also creates a great opportunity to build wealth in communities that can actually support the local economy. Well, unfortunately, I think that's all the time we have questions for, but uh, thank you so much, Nathaniel. That was wonderful.